On this episode, we talk with serial entrepreneur and best-selling author, Mark Jeffrey. Here's a preview of our conversation. And so then we met at the top of the Rockefeller Plaza building, and literally in five minutes, we raised $12 million. <laughs> wow. I don't know if I could ever do that again, but it did happen once. Okay, so welcome to episode three of the Ozzy Osbourne Show. I'm your host, William J. Bruce III, and with me on the phone is Mark Jeffrey. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, William. I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, first off, um, I'll just say I- I'm a huge fan uh, of, uh, of you, and um, I'm sure you know of that. Um, so anyways, uh, now you're an award-winning serial entrepreneur, uh, of innovative technology. What are some of your projects? Well, the uh, most recent one, the one I'm working on right now, is called Guardian Circle. And uh, it's, it's an app, and it's basically a way for uh, let's friends, family, and neighbors to protect one another. So you think of it as sort of this uh, Amber Alert social network, but for everything. So the way it works is you download the app, and then you ask those close to you to, uh, to be your guardians in the system. So it's sort of like a friend request. Um, and hopefully they say yes, and they download the app also. And uh, sometime later, when you have an emergency of some sort, it could be something small, it could be something large. Uh, you tap an alert button, that sends an alert notification out to all your guardians. So right now, all their phones are buzzing, and there's an alert on their screen. And when they click through, they're sent direct to your alert room where you're already waiting for them. So the alert room has basically two parts. There's a map at the top that shows everyone's location, including yours. So you're kind of blinking because you're the one in trouble. As your guardians come in, they pop up on the map wherever they happen to be at that moment. Um, and then there's a chat room at the bottom, so everyone can talk. So now everybody knows where everybody else is, and everyone can communicate. So now they can come up with a plan to help you fast. So it's sort of a peer-to-peer 911 emergency grid. Um, and that, this is the base level product. So everything I just described is and will always be free. Um, and we're going to be building all kinds of uh, services that will uh, be optional, but paid services on top of the free service. Okay. Now, just to clarify, you're the, the founder of this, right? Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah, I sort of lead, lead, uh, I sort of lead two lives. <laughs> one, I'm an author, and the other, I basically do these technology companies. Um, and I've been doing them now for, uh, the technology companies anyway, for about 20 years. So I actually started doing that. Uh, before I was ever an author. And um, some of the other ones, the, the other big ones I've done, uh, there's one called Palace that I did in 1995. Okay. Sold it in 1999. Uh, that one was sort of an avatar chat, uh, sort of like Second Life, but okay. uh, constrained by the technology of the late 90s, of course. And, um, and then I did another one called Zero Degrees, which was a social, a business social network. We started, so it's very like LinkedIn. Uh, we started at almost exactly the same time as LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, we basically, we did it down here in LA. So we couldn't get it funded, unfortunately. So Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn got his fund because he was sort of valid, you know, more, you know, he had PayPal under his belt. Right. I had the palace. The palace did sell. That was nice, but it wasn't anything like PayPal. Um, and so we, uh, we ended up selling it in 2000. We started in 2002. We sold it in 2004 to Barry Diller's Interactive Corporation. So we okay. did get an exit out of it, and that was great. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so you basically sold it to him, and uh, and then uh, he basically said, well, look, all of our business units are, are uh, P&L, and each one of them is either number one or number two in their category. So go off and figure out what is the reason is business, and come back and make it number one or number two in its category. you got to remember time. Nobody knew how these things made money. It right. seems yeah. obvious in retrospect, but like looking forward from that moment was not at all. It wasn't obvious to LinkedIn. It wasn't obvious to us. Um, you know, we had all, we had hundreds of them. As, you know, it was some of them were things like, hey, this just basically collects a bunch of email addresses that we then use to, um, you know, send out newsletters with products in it, and that's how we make money off the products. You know, just to give you an idea of the kind of crazy things are being discussed. So, um, so basically, I went off into a corner for about a month and came back and said, "Hey, it's a big job sport." That's what, it's like. and uh, which was the correct answer in retrospect. And uh, I presented it to Diller, and Diller said, "Well, 
Um, if you're a jobs board, that means you're competing with Monster.com. Monster.com spends a hundred million a year on advertising. Therefore, I would have to spend a hundred million a year on advertising in order to compete. Uh, therefore, no. <laughs> and uh, he said, "Go away and come back with an, another plan." I, I, my my reaction was something along the lines of, "Well, this is the correct answer. Uh, there there is no other uh, possible answer. There's only all the wrong ones." And uh, he he uh, he disagreed. <laughs> so <laughs> he uh, so basically he said, "Look, I'll buy you guys out of your contracts," and that kind of ended that. So, um, but it was a nice exit for us. And uh, right. we did we did get the question we did get the hard questions right. So okay. I'm proud of it nonetheless. Okay. So those are the two, the two big ones. Uh, the palace had about 10 million users at its peak. Yeah. Um, which for the late nineties was huge. Like today, you know, that wouldn't be that big, but in, the, in those days, that was a lot of people. Right. Um, yeah, for sure. Of, and, uh, zero degrees had about a million users when we saw it to IHC and, um, and LinkedIn had two million. So we were behind them, but we were definitely within shooting distance. Okay. Now, uh, for the palace, you actually raised 12 million from Time Warner, Intel, and SoftBank. Uh, you, you negotiated, yes. yeah, you negotiated a deal with Intel, uh, to have your, it bundled with every desktop sold. How do you, how does somebody go about, you know, even starting to do something like that? Like, how, how does that happen? Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, that was, <laughs> well, I was trying to solve. That was always the big question before I started doing stuff like this. Okay. And even, you know, becoming an author, it's really the same question. How do you, how do you get your stuff out there? How do you uh, break out above, above the noise? And I will tell you how I did it both times. So, um, with the palace, um, so the main ingredient is you just talk to anybody who will listen to you. Don't worry about, um, whether it feels like you're succeeding or not. Just, right. just keep going, keep going, keep buggering on, as uh, Winston Churchill used to say. And, um, so the example of that, I, that, that really made the difference for the past. So we released it in November of 1995. Right. It did okay. We sort of advertised it in some news groups. That's what we did back then. Okay. Uh, but the main thing that really made it take off was I went to an internal Time Warner conference, an internal IT conference. So these are the guys that were setting up people's emails, right? So really? Okay. For all the different, uh, right. So it was the most boring. Uh, possible conference you could ever think of to go to, but it was an <laughs> opportunity to get on stage. But it was an opportunity to get on stage and talk in front of people. Exactly. That was the main requirement. And I was like, I was finishing buttons. I'm like, what's going to work? I don't know. So I got up on stage and, uh, pretty much the whole audience just looked at me like I had nine heads and didn't really care because they were all talking about important things. And I had this like crazy kooky cartoon thing. It sort of, that's how it played in their minds. Um, which I was awesome. And, uh, and I definitely had that enthusiasm when I was on stage talking about it. Uh, but what I didn't know is that there was a guy in the back called Craig Kanerick, who was a founder of a company called Razorfish, which later became enormous. Uh, and he basically saw it, and his eyes bugged out of his head. He's like, oh, my God, this is the best thing I've ever seen. And he went wow. and wrote about it to a mailing list in New York. And uh, from that, and we suddenly get started getting downloads like crazy. All the people wow. in New York took to it like a fish to the wall. So it became huge in New York. And then we got a lot of press because all the press was in New York. And, right. and that started spreading all over the world. So that's really how the sort of viral boom of, of the palace happened. Okay. Um, why? Because I went to a stupid conference that I thought was a dead end and I had no idea it was going to explode into what it did. Wow. So the other thing, so how did the Intel thing happen? Um, <laughs> that's a pretty, that is a very interesting story. And I will tell you that. Too. Okay. It's a good one. I've actually never told this story. Really? Been, that's been, and there's a reason why, but I will, uh, it's been years and years, so I think it's okay to tell now. Okay. So, um, so basically, <laughs> yeah, so basically I had, uh, been calling people at, uh, so I, I, first of all, I got an inbound call from Intel because of the press we were getting, because of the Time Warner conference that I did that I thought was a dead end. Um, I got an inbound call from a low level guy at Intel who basically said, Hey, we just want to talk to you about what you're doing and learn more and la la la. Anyway, that conversation sort of escalated up the food chain at Intel because I kept talking to this guy. And I realized that Intel felt like they had missed the boat by not owning Netscape and, uh, you know, owning the browser, um, which is something Intel greatly desired because if they owned the browser, they could drive the need for more and more powerful chips, you know, sort of create artificial demand by creating it, by uh, building more capabilities into the browser. 
Um, so I realized that since they had uh, what I termed at the time browser lust, <laughs> I said, well, geez, you know, this is the chat browser. And nobody has captured this market yet. And it's something Intel could own. And imagine if there was multimedia built into it. Because remember, it's late 90s, so that was still like a cool thing. Um, video and audio and all kinds of things you need more and more chips for. And their eyes bugged out of their heads and said, oh, my God, yes, we love it. So I started talking to him. And I said, well, look, what I want is I want to be bundled on every uh, piece of hardware that you guys ship. I read about how other software companies have become successful doing that. Yeah. And they agreed because they, their interests were uh, were aligned with that. Wow. So, um, so, but that didn't raise money for the company. So, okay. Uh, and, and the thing that a lot of people don't know is we were actually, a, we were actually a division of a CD-ROM. Uh, we were actually inside of a CD-ROM division of Time Warner. At the Okay. And, uh, which, so I was trying to figure out how do I spin this out into a standalone company? I didn't own any stock in it. <laughs> so right. Like, okay. There's got to be some way to do this. And I just didn't know how to do it. And I was like, there's got to be a way. <laughs> and, um, so I, a little bit of luck came along. Uh, Turner, Turner Broadcasting, Time Warner decided to merge at, a, at almost exactly that moment. Right. And yeah. there were, yes. And there were several CD ROM divisions of which we were one. That were all hemorrhaging red ink. So I knew that the executive in charge of all the CD ROM divisions, um, basically had three F's on his report card and he needed an A, otherwise his head was on the chopping block because of the Time Warner Turner merger. But all the books come out and everybody looks at everything very closely. So I called him up and I said, Hey, I got this crazy idea. Why don't you let us spin out into our own company and, um, uh, and basically when we, and we'll get an investment as part of that, but just take part of the investment off the table. Just, you put it in your pocket. That way you have invested, you know, call it 300K into the palace as a project. And you would realize something like a $3 million return in like nine months. And then you'll look like a genius. And he readily, he knew this was his lifeboat. So he said, Oh yes, I love that idea. He said, can that be done? I said, I don't know. Let me find out. So then I called the people and I said, hey, so how would you like to own this? And they said, oh, really? You can? Is that possible? <laughs> I've never heard of a company wow. spinning out of Time Warner. Wow. And I said, well, I think it might be possible, but it has to come with a sizable investment. And I explained the situation. And they said, okay, well, let me get back to you. So then they came back and said, yeah, I want to do it. And they brought along SoftBank, which was a big venture capital, one of the largest uh, big venture capital companies one of the largest in the world, actually. And uh, they said, you know, uh, SoftBank would be putting in most of the money. Intel would put in some of the money. Okay. And uh, they said, look, if you think you can pull this off within Time Warner, we'll do it. So I said, great. Let me call back at Time Warner. So I did. Everyone was, I realized this deal was possible. And so then we met at the top of the Rockefeller Plaza building and literally in five minutes, we raised $12 million. <laughs> wow. I don't know if I could ever do that again, but it did happen once. That's, that's sweet. Um, okay, so, so sorry, you're good. Gonna, you're, okay. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, so how do you come up with ideas? Like, cause you, you, you have very innovative ideas. What, what, what sparks them? Um, I basically, well, I have questions that I ask. Okay. It's about asking questions yep. that I don't know the answer to. Um, so, uh, well, I'll tell you how I came up with Guardian Circle. Um, so I was, I, I and I've been trying to think of an idea for a company, mind you, for about two years. I kept okay. coming up with things that were okay, but right. every time I investigated each one of them, I figured out that there was probably something wrong. Okay. Um, and that's just, you know, it's trial and error too, in some, some ways. You're just, it's like Edison trying different materials to vent the light bulb. Most of them don't work. Um, that's the, that's the, the, you know, the early part of it. So I, um, I'd been speaking with, uh, I'm actually friends with Travis Kalnick, who, uh, is the guy that founded Uber. Okay. Um, yeah. he, and so he and I were speaking, uh, in late 2014 and, um, we were talking about Uber's future plans. And this was right after Travis had raised that ungodly amount of money. I mean, he's literally raised more money than any human has ever raised for anything ever. <laughs> At the time, he raised like a couple billion, which was pretty eye popping. Nothing compared to what came after, but okay. um, but he was basically explaining to the press what he was going to do with that money. Was he said something along the lines of, 
well, we've gotten pretty good at moving people. Now we want to move things. Hmm. And um, we were discussing this, and I expressed that I actually did not like that idea. Um, and he said, well, why? And I said, well, what Uber really do that and what you, where you've made your money is you're basically just an intelligence group. It looks down on the world from the sky and sees all the people moving around, sees all the cars moving around. And you know that in this minute and a half window, that car and this person are perfect matches for one another in terms of doing business. This right. guy needs a ride. He's right there. This guy's got a car. He wants to give a ride. He's right there. Um, but another minute passes, and then the pairing is no longer valid, and new pairings are much more valid. And so the value you provide is the God's eye of that situation. But it's only valuable because every every piece of it is always in motion. If you get into the world of, of things, okay. things don't move. Uh, your your core competency, your intelligence grid is suddenly useless. What you do well is suddenly u- useless. And what's useful are warehouses and trucks and centralized locations. But that is a game that is played best by Amazon and by Federal Express. And right. I'm going to learn that you're behind if you try to compete with that. So I just don't like, I just don't think it's a good idea. We disagreed on that, obviously. Okay. But he, um, he basically came back and said, well, if it were you, what, what other, in- I said, what do you think we should do? And I said, I think you should go after other intelligence grid problems because that's what you're good at. And he said, well, like what? And I said, well, I, I don't know because I just came up with this about a minute ago. Um, so that was, what is another intelligence grid problem that hasn't been solved yet? And I, and I really could not come up with one thing. Okay. And then about two weeks later, uh, my girlfriend had uh, what appeared to be a stroke. Right. And I found her on the floor alone in her garage oh, uh, about wow. an hour after it started. She couldn't, she'd been trying to text me and she just couldn't kind of get the coordination together to do it. Right. Uh, she could have pushed a button, but she didn't have a button push. Um, okay. Got her to the hospital. She's fine. Everything's good. Um, so it all turned out okay. But I realized after the fact that when she was lying there in the garage, there was literally help all around her. She just had no way to contact it. So, for example, her neighbor was home. And right. while her neighbor's not like her best friend or anything, he is a useful ally, especially in an emergency. Yes. He certainly would have been willing to help. Yeah. So there's the neighbor. One of her best friends lives very close by on an adjoining street. Another friend happened to be driving by her place right around the time when she was having the attack. Found out later. I was less than a mile away the whole time. I just didn't know anything was going on. So mm-hmm. there was all this. If you look down on a map, you can see all this help all around her, but it doesn't know she's in trouble. So right. what she needed was a way to, A, contact all that help, and B, all that help needed to know about all the other help. So we all needed to know about each other. So we all knew each other's relative position. So we knew who was closest, right. and who could get to her the fastest. And we could coordinate our efforts to help her. And, and I realized, oh, my God, this is an intelligence grid problem. This is exactly the kind of thing I was trying to think of two weeks ago. So that really is what led to the birth of Guardian Circle. It's all about just asking the question of, like, you know, what is what, is, what you want to what is what are you trying to accomplish, or what is the kind of thing that you're trying to do? I can tell you with the palace, what got me excited was um, I used to work at a company called Delphi Internet, okay. and um, Delphi was acquired by Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation. So these were a lot of print people for the most part, and they were very excited about creating all this online content, basically sort of printing pages but online. Okay. They saw you know the online, they saw the web is basically an infinite. Uh, page machine where they could just publish and publish and publish and they didn't have the cost of printing. Um, so they could, you know, they saw it as a way to expand content. Whereas when I actually looked at the service and the way it was being used, something like 90% of it was in bulletin boards and chat. Right. So they realized that actually people didn't care about consuming the professionally could produce content just as they cared about consuming each other. Right. They wanted to communicate with each other. It was more of a really interesting thing than it was you know, uh, a publishing vehicle. So I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So bottom line is because I realized that people want to communicate with each other, which has turned out, you know, it's now become Snapchat and Facebook and Twitter and, and you know, sort of the mainstays of the Internet. That's actually proven to be completely true. Uh, the Palace was kind of a primordial version of that, that same thing that allowed people to communicate with each other in a, in a multimedia chat space. Okay. So... 
So I was kind of like, what is this? I want to do this thing. I don't know what it is, but it's somehow this interactive space between people, not publisher to people. So that was the question I began with. And, uh, it's sort of a long story about how I eventually arrived at Dallas, but that was kind of how I started. Okay. Now, uh, you've also authored eight books. Um, how, uh, how do you balance your time between being an author and being an entrepreneur? Um, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. So every time I've, I've written novels, um, I've been exclusively focused on that and that alone. Okay. Um, and when I'm doing companies, I do those companies and I do that and that alone. So right now, my primary focus is Guardian Circle. I am not working on any novels at all right now. Okay. Um, so basically the first time, and I'll, I'll tell you, so my, my, uh, my second company, uh, we've talked about my successes. Yes. My second company was a complete and abject failure. Okay. And, um, and that was basically 1999 through 2001. I eventually had to close it down. Um, that was a very sad time. And, uh, and I yeah. lost all my palace money. <laughs> oh, so no. I know myself, don't do that again. Yes. Well, I got it back in zero degrees. So it was okay. okay. But okay, uh, for good. a while there, it was not good. Yeah. And then, um, but I, but I suddenly had a lot of downtime and, uh, and the, the industry was completely dead for several years. So that's when I started writing the first Max Quick book because I suddenly had a lot of time on my hands. And I figured, okay. what the hell? Why not? I have the time now. I'd always wanted to do it, but I just never had the time or, um, or I, did, I didn't really feel like I could finish anything uh, creatively. And suddenly, I had all this time, and I could do it. And it was really the first time in my life that just flowed. So that's when I wrote Max Quick, The Pocket Independent. And um, it, did, it took me a long time to write, though. It took me about a year and a half. Okay. But I rewrote it several times because I didn't really know what the hell I was doing at first. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and then, um, and then basically after... And then that was the only book that was out for a while. And then after we sold Zero Degrees, um, I suddenly I, I decided not to work for about a year, year and a half, and okay. uh, just write novels. So I did that, and I just took the time. That's when I wrote, you know, kind of the bulk of the novels that are out now. Uh, the Two Travelers, Max Quick Two, The Two Travelers was written there. Um, a bunch of Max Quick Three, The Bane of the Bondsman was also written there. Although I didn't return to it until like maybe five or six years later and finish it. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was sort of how that all happened. And then, um, in 2007, I got a call from, uh, uh, Jason Calcanis, who's now fairly well known in the industry. And he basically had a term sheet from Sequoia, which is the world's top venture capitalist. And he said, Hey, I've got this, uh, I got a term sheet from Sequoia and we're building a new type of search engine. Um, and I need a CTO and it's here in LA. Would you be interested? And I, yeah, I said, yes, it seemed like a very, it was, it seemed like a very good idea at the time. For sure. Sequoia, for those of you who don't know, is the same company that backed Apple and Google and Yahoo. So, yeah. uh, they had quite the lineage of backing and they only back big things for the most part. So, so I said yes to that. Yeah. And, uh, I did that for about four years and I was able to split my time a little bit there because it wasn't my company. I was CTO of someone else's company. Okay. So it's not quite the weight of being a CEO and a founder. Right. Um, so I was able to still do some writing during that period. Um, so that's when I sort of wrote, um, oh God, probably uh, the Armand Ptolemy stuff, uh, Age of Aether, uh, a few of those books kind of got their start then. Okay. So uh, that was really the only time I was, I was, the only time I was able to split my time effectively. And then other than that, it's been either one or the other. Okay. Um, so I'll ask you, since you did like a, a series, when you wrote the first Max Quick book. Uh, did you know it was going to be part of a series or was it something that you sort of revisited later, in, uh, with sort of the success of the first or? I, uh, I, I wanted to, re well, I always had, um, some sort of series in mind. Okay. Um, I will, I know that, but I didn't know A, whether it was any good, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and B, whether anyone would like the book, right? So right. whatever, I decided whatever I wrote, it could stand alone just fine on its own and you wouldn't feel like, you know, there was no ending. Um, so I definitely wanted something that was a standalone piece in case I never returned to it for one reason or another. Right. Uh, but with enough open end that if I wanted to return to it, it wouldn't feel like I was just sort of, you know, inventing ways to get back into the storyline. Right. So I did leave myself a few little, uh, you know, you never find out what Max's secret is in the first book. Okay. That's never told. That's never explored. It's just sort of presented as, hey, there's this thing. Okay. Um, 
But you do feel like you know the book ended it's been searched to be the top of the top. Okay. And um so how did like um I guess because you said that you had always sort of wanted to to write, uh, was that sort of the same thing with you know with, with business? Um, were, were both those things sort of passions as as a kid, or how did they were both things I always wanted to do? I actually went to college. Uh, I started as an English major because I thought that I would. I just thought I'd go into writing, right? Um, and I very quickly um, kind of wised up and realized that that was actually a very bad idea. Uh, to invest in college, um, I figured if I was there, I should learn something useful, uh, which was the correct decision. Um, because without a computer science degree, I wouldn't have been able to sort of do a lot of the things that I, I was able to do and work for the companies I was able to work for, which led me to freedom um, that I needed really to write uh, and, and do it right. And then even after, and then also after having written the Max Quick Book, I was faced with the same problem that I was in business, which was, how do I make this thing successful? How do right. I break out of the noise? Um, because I'm just like, I'm just another dude with a self-published novel, <laughs> right. of which there are tens of millions. Yeah. And uh, most of those people sell one copy to their mom, right. uh, literally. So yes. I'm like, somehow I've got to escape this gravity well. How do I do it? And I was basically, I tried a lot of different things. And again, it was another quite, it was another case of, punching buttons in the great glass elevator just to see what they'll do and not being afraid to try anything and everything. Okay. Um, and so what I did was I started going to writer conferences. Why? I don't know. Cause writers were there and publishers were there. I was learning. Right. And, um, what I, what I learned what, from a friend of mine was, uh, who had, who had been published was that, um, you know, you basically, you needed an agent in order to be published, uh, professionally. There was right. no other way to go about doing it. Uh, so it was very uninternet like It was a club. And you had to get into the club somehow. So I was like, all right, right. I'm going to start going to the places where the people that are in the club are and try to get to know them. So I went to a uh, the World Fantasy Conference in Phoenix. Okay. In, I'm trying to remember what year it was in, but it was probably 2004, maybe, end of 2004. Okay. Yeah, that sounds right. It was in the 2004. So I went to the World Fantasy Conference, and um, a lot of authors were there, a lot of publishers, and a lot of agents. None of them wanted to talk to me. Everyone was just like, go away, kid. Go away. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I tried. <laughs> yeah. And uh, very earnestly. And uh, I even I even got a chance to do a reading there in front of, like, three people. Um, so this all felt like a big festival of failure, right? Like, it doesn't right. feel good at all. None of this is good. Um, but one of the conversations that I ended up having was, was with this guy who had sort of a card table, you know, tucked away in some corner of this, of this thing. Okay. And he ran a podcast called The Dragon Page. Okay. I didn't know what a podcast was. Even though I was in the tech world, it just was something that I'd never crossed my path. And uh, I started talking to him. He's like, yeah, we do these podcasts. And so, this is this a sci-fi podcast? And like, we review sci-fi books and movies and all kinds of things. We've got a you know, decent-sized listener base. And uh, he based, his, his name was Evo Terra. Yeah. And Evo, yeah, you know, Evo has become quite well-known since then. Yeah. But back then, nobody knew who Evo was. And Evo was like, yeah, I got this kooky idea. He said he thinks authors should podcast their novels for free. I was like, really? Like, what, what would you, uh, how would you do that? And he basically described, what, you know, the patio book to me before yeah. anyone had done any patio books. And, uh, and he said, look, if you agree to do it with your book, I will promote it on the Dragon page. That was all I needed to hear. <laughs> I was like, aha, free promotion. Yeah. And also, it's the kind of thing that I really like, which is there's no other authors thinking about this or doing this. Nobody else is there. Right. So if you can get there before everyone else, then you can reap um, exponentially larger rewards just simply because you were there early. I've seen this before on the Internet. Yes. And I realized that this was sort of the author's version of doing the same thing. So I said, yes, I will do it. So um, I came out with my first episode in March of 2005, uh, the same week that Scott Sigler did. So we both, and apparently Evo had been talking to Sigler also. So I wasn't the first. Okay. Sigler and I came out at the same time. T. Morris said that he was doing it in 2014. I don't really, to be honest with you, I don't really remember okay. like, who was actually technically first. Um, I do know that the three of us at one point were the only three doing it. 
that much I'm sure I recall. Okay. So, and I, and Evo was promoting all three of us on Dragon Age. So, uh, so anyway, whatever. We all, all three of us started podcasting our audiobooks. We were the only three in the world doing it. And then, uh, in, sometime in June of 2015, all of a sudden Apple added podcasting support to, uh, to iTunes and all of our numbers just went through the roof. Okay. And for the three of us, we were the only three audiobooks that were available in the world for free. So we all just, you know, got huge, huge audiences. Millions of people downloaded our stuff. So without a doubt, I mean, just sort of being in the right place at the right time it helped us tremendously. There's no question that was a component of this. Um, the, on the other hand, though, if, uh, if, if we had sucked, then people would have listened to like one chapter and not listened to the rest of it. So it was, it wasn't just being in the right place at the right time. It was more to it than that. But it was, without a doubt, we wouldn't have gotten a hearing without that. For sure. Um, but I got that because I was earnestly pushing every single button I could and trying every crazy cookie thing I could think of to try to get my head up above the noise and, uh, and do something different. You got to do something different than everyone else is doing and go where everybody else is looking. Yeah. Everybody's looking somewhere that it's done and you have no opportunity. So I, I shy away from it. Where everybody else is, like right now, everybody's VR and AR. I wouldn't touch that with a 10 foot pole because everybody's there. So all you're doing is getting into a knife fight with everybody else. Right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's just, I look for things that are weird and off to the side. Like nobody's thinking about safety. Like it's not cool to do safety. That's why I'm interested in it, partly. Right. So, um, yeah. So that's the long and the short of that. <laughs> So now the dragon page that that's partybooks dot com. Um, the dragon page was actually a separate thing. Okay. Before partybooks. Okay. So the dragon page was a, was a podcast that Evo did with another guy, and um, and Mike was not part of partybooks. Partybooks was something that Evo came up with on his own. Okay. And later started the partybooks site. And after there was a whole bunch of partybooks, they didn't really live anywhere. They were just sort of. You know, on iTunes, if you could find your way to them. So eventually, Evo created a company, you know, formalized the Patio Books offering, and then uh, uh, that was completely separate from Mike and, and the Dragon Page. Okay. So the Dragon Page was where it was promoted in the early days. Okay. And uh, just for the the record, would we'll say like you, so you had two point five million downloads of your first book. Yes. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. That was over a period of a couple of years, and it wasn't all at once, but yeah, uh, but yeah, that was fairly sizable. And, all, and, all, and to be fair, all of us kind of got Scott. Scott did better than everybody else. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. She did very well, also. You know, and then later we had that uh, J.C. Hutchins and uh, you know Mer Lafferty, who now has won the, uh, the Parsec Award. She's well, she won several Parsec Awards, and she's won the um, oh, what's the the Joseph W. Campbell Award. Which okay. is a huge award. Yeah. So, and, uh, she apparently has a Netflix series based on one of her books that's in development right now. Really? I didn't so know. So she has that. done extraordinarily well. Wow. She came out of the whole podcasting world that we did. So. That's, that's really cool. I'm actually interviewing her next week. So it's, uh, it's good to hear. Uh, um, you will enjoy her. She is great. Yeah. Her books are great too. I've read, I've read them all, but I've read most of them. Okay. So, Mur, Mur spins a, Mur spins a good yarn. That's good. Um, okay, so you do the podcasting and you do like school Skype in sessions. What other sort of innovative things are you, are you sort of up to today to sort of help like promote your, your works? Um, well, I've definitely, I've been doing podcast interviews like this one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I, I do continue, I do into a lot of schools. So, um, and I, I always, and I'm just going to get on my high horse here for just one moment. Sure. Preachy, my, my soapbox, not really high horse. <laughs> There's a lot of authors out there, especially children's authors, that charge to appear. Yes. I didn't know this, this phenomenon existed until I started getting into it. And people started asking me, well, how much do you charge? I'm like, what do you mean charge? Well, I don't know. How much do we have to pay you to come, like, we're paying me. I'm, I'm coming into your classroom basically to plug my stuff. Yeah. I'm like a sales. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm paying you for access to, you know, your audience, otherwise known as your kids. Yeah. Second of all, charging children is just evil. And, yes. and you should not be, that's just, if you're doing that, there's something wrong. There's <laughs> a lot of authors that don't feel that way. 
I feel that way very strongly. I'm like, look, dude, you're getting, you're going into a classroom. You do it because it's fun and, and you enjoy talking to kids and that's kind of cool. And they think it's, to them, it's like, you know, Mick Jagger showing up. So just remember when you were a kid, how awesome it was with somebody like that showed up at your school. Now you're the dude. Why don't you go and do that just because it's cool? Yeah, exactly. And don't charge people for it for crying out loud. So anyway, so a lot of authors do that. And I'm very, very, very obviously against that practice. So all the stuff I'm doing is obviously totally for free. And, and I, I can't believe it's even a discussion, but it is. I, so, so yeah, so I'm just doing a lot of Skype ins to, um, to schools. A lot of them are in Maine because, uh, I was up for the Maine student book award like a year and a half ago. Okay. So I get something like that. And so, so basically a lot of schools in Maine had me on this like reading list that all the, all the kids, uh, read. They had to read the books in order to vote. So a lot of them, so Max Quick is huge in Maine. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> sort of makes sense because I'm from New Hampshire. So people yeah. in Maine think like me. So I can, I can kind of see it. So, um, so yeah, so there's been a lot of Skype ins to mostly Maine schools, but there's been, there's been ones in Texas. There have been a few in. Uh, California, actually, Northern California. Okay. Uh, Washington State, uh, Texas, uh, and New Hampshire, actually, my own home state. Just like the last one I did was in New Hampshire. So, so yeah. The Skype interviews tend to be pretty fun and easy and quick. And, um, and the kids like it because they can see you, right? You're not some sort of, uh, formless, uh, you know, faceless voice. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I will say, though, the one thing, the, the one skill you must have to do this, you have to answer the exact same question and asked of you three times in a row. <laughs> what inspired you to write this book? And they, you will be asked it literally three times in a row. And you have to come up with a different answer or make it sound different every time. So they don't feel like, you can't just be like, dude, I just answered that question. You can't do that way. You got to be like, oh, that's a great question. Okay, well, so here's the answer. And somehow it's different than the answer I just gave five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. So that's the one skill you have to learn. So if you can do that. Then... Yeah, I, I share with you the, the view of uh, Skyping in for free. I, I totally agree. There shouldn't be, no one should be making money off that. That's, um, as you said, you're, you're pumping your book. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. So now for current projects, obviously the, the Guardian Circle, which you had touched on before. Um, so you had won uh, the launch festival. Um, so congratulations, by the way. Um, Thank you. I also see that you have a new book, the the case for Bitcoin. This is like, a, I guess, this is sort of the the second book to the same topic. What is what what is a Bitcoin for those of us who do? Yes. Know? Um. So yeah. So there are. I do have two books. So I have eight books in total. Two of them are six of them are novels. Um, and two of them are Bitcoin books, as you say. Uh, the first one is Bitcoin Explained Simply, and the second one is The Case for Bitcoin. So um, so what is Bitcoin? Um, well, if you listen to some, it's magical internet money. <laughs> right. Uh, but more practically speaking, there's nothing magical about it. Um, Bitcoin is a currency that is native to the internet. So okay. when dollars were invented, there was no internet, so... Uh, we printed pieces of paper and we stored them in metal vaults. And because they were physical, they could be taken from us. So right. instead of storing it under our mattress or in our house, we put them in bags with dollar signs on them and put them in a big steel vault. And, uh, when, you know, it basically collectivized our protection of our paper. Um, and that's just the way it was, uh, back in the old West all the way up to like, you know, the fifties or whatever. And, um, but nobody had really reinvented money that was digital native. Okay. Um, and so I'll, so I'll explain what I mean by that. So yeah. um, imagine if you could transmit money anywhere in the world instantly. And I'm talking like within about 10 minutes uh, when I say instant. Um, imagine if you could transmit any amount of money anywhere um, within 10 minutes as easily as sending an email. Now, it might sound like I'm talking about PayPal. Right. So even, but PayPal is not really the same thing. Okay. Um, PayPal. Well, so let me talk about Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, when you're using something like PayPal, your money still isn't really in your possession. It's really in PayPal's possession. 
Right. So you don't actually have it in your pocket. You have cash in your pocket. However, when you have Bitcoin, you have it effectively in your pocket in the same way. There is no bank. There is no intermediary. There's nobody who can put a hold on your accounts. Um, it's yours at every bit as much as cash is yours. Okay. So Bitcoin is a way to recreate cash uh, and, and private ownership of that cash online and a way to transmit cash digitally without any intermediary, any bank, person to person, directly, the way you can hand someone a dollar bill um, over the internet. And uh, Bitcoin can do this because of a specific technological innovation called the blockchain, which I won't get into here because that's a super long discussion. For sure. Other than to say that the blockchain, the invention of the blockchain is somewhat analogous to the invention of the printing press or the steam engine. That is, it is a fundamental breakthrough, um, and it's one of the most important inventions in human history. Okay. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's that class of invention. It's just uh, a way of doing code that no one had thought of before. And it's one of those things that is so elegant and beautiful. Just so, it's, it's so crazily simple. It's like, it's like the description in Amadeus of Mozart's music, uh, where Salieri goes, looking at the page, it was simple, almost comical. <laughs> and, uh, but somehow it was Mozart and you weren't. That's the way Bitcoin is. It's so simple. You just think it can't be that simple, but it is. And, um, and there's something about the, the way in which it's executed and the way together that make it work that is, um, so elegant and simple that it is Beatles-like or Mozart-like. But implemented in code. Okay. So now, if someone, like, so Bitcoin, to clarify, it exists today. Um, and, uh, can, like, how does that work for, for transferring money, like, with different currencies? How does that? So all of those currencies must first be, um, exchanged for Bitcoin. And there are multiple sites where you can go and do this. Okay. So, the two big ones are Coinbase, okay. um, which is backed by Andreessen Horowitz, so they're they're backed by a legit Silicon Valley VC. Okay. Mark Andreessen being the guy that invented the web browser, he's now a venture capitalist, he's behind this. Wow. Um, and the other one is Gemini, uh, and that's at Gemini.com, the other one's at Coinbase.com. Gemini is run by the Winklevoss brothers, otherwise known as the Winklevoss of uh, Facebook fame. Okay. <laughs> or the enemies of Facebook, if you will. So they're, they're the twin brothers that were in the uh, social network. So they're now very, very, very into Bitcoin. So they run one of the two large, largest exchanges. And you basically get an account on one of these exchanges and, uh, you load it up with money. You do a bank transfer. They have effectively a bank account that you can, a bear end that you can put your money into. And then you, uh, and then you buy Bitcoin and you can buy it in any amount you want. You don't have to just buy one Bitcoin, by the way. It's a common misconception. Okay. You can buy. Uh, anywhere up to a hundred millionth of a Bitcoin. Okay. Um, so it's very, very, very divisible. Uh, it's not just, you know, one Bitcoin costs something like 600 bucks right now at this moment. You okay. don't have to pony up 600 bucks for one Bitcoin. You can buy a dollar's worth of Bitcoin. So, uh, okay. Yeah. And then you have it. And then it's in your Bitcoin wallet. And, um, you can fit in the Bitcoin wallet that is provided for you by Gemini and Coinbase. They have like a cloud wallet. So imagine. Imagine something like Gmail, but it's a Bitcoin wallet. So same idea, you log into it. Um, but that's still owned and operated by that company. They're perfectly, and I'm sure it's perfectly safe there. Uh, but if you really want to be super safe, you can uh, create your own Bitcoin wallet on your home computer um, and download your Bitcoin to your own wallet on your local chain. Uh, but then it's on that computer. You can use that computer, and that computer dies, your Bitcoins go with it. Because it is like cash, just like if you lose an actual dollar bill, you've lost your dollar bill, and there's you can't go crying to the bank. Right. Once it's in your possession, it's in your possession, and it's up to you to protect it. Okay. So, uh, there are other solutions. There's a thing called a ledger wallet, which is a piece of hardware, kind of like a it's sort of like a thumb drive. You plug it in the back of your computer. Okay. You load your bitcoins into that, and it has a lot of security uh, built into it. In fact, it has so much security built into it, it is effectively it is the same exact security that a bank uses to store electronic cash. Wow. There's no difference. It's just that it's just like a, it's like a bank on a thumb drive. Wow. And it's 
every bit is safe. Wow. So even if someone, and there are ways to, uh, if you lost that thumb drive, because I'm sure a lot of people think, well, what if I lose the thumb drive? It's a good question. If you lose the thumb drive, uh, in Ledger's case, there's a 20 word, um, I call it a passphrase. Okay. Uh, made of common words like, um, you know, suits, leather, Christmas, you know, that you, re- if you memorize those 20 words, you can reconstitute your Bitcoin wallet. If you lost your thumb drive, you just get another thumb drive and type in those 20 words and boom, you've got all your Bitcoin back again. Very so there, nice. there are very clever reconstitution schemes that they've come up with. Because money is digital, there are ways to protect what you can't do with physical money. Right, exactly. Okay, so we're just, uh, I'd say out of, out of time. Um, what, what's your, your website? Where can people find you? Uh, I am at markjeffrey.net. Uh, okay. So that's my main author site. Now that's. Um, guardiancircle.com is where Guardian Circle lives. Of course, it's available for Android and iOS. So it's just, it's in the iTunes and the Google Play Store also. Okay. And that's Mark Jeffrey, J E F F R E Y, not E R Y. Um, yes, correct. Yes. Yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, misspelling. Yeah. I always thought it was spelled the other way before. So I, I thought I'll just clarify that for anyone listening. So. All right. Well, yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, Mark, thank you so much for, for being on the show. It's, it's a great honor to, to talk with you and, and just to sort of pick your brain on, on some of this stuff. Oh, William, thank you so much for having me both ways. Yeah, thank you. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, guys. Thank you for tuning into the Ozzy Osbourne Radio Show. For more episodes, you can check out OzzyOsbourne.com. That's A-U-S-S-I-E Osbourne.com. God bless.